Question for the one those points? You can do that. Ah, okay. So you have something like that. Yeah, yeah. You have to delete your server if you want. Yes, yes, it's a custom one. Exactly. its own schema or this one runs in central objects. So we have met different uh, schemas for all these type of uh, tables. So universal table graphs we'll come back to it later but it has all kinds of nice, nice features. So you can open remote databases if you want to check other things you can open the central object repository. Let's say for example I want to see all reports System code mandatory, 42 sales order, 56 user reserved. Most clients will do like this 55 copy of a standard object, 56 new objects, 57 EDI related or something, and so they will divide the user reserved range. Yeah. Copy standard objects? Yes, possible. Yeah. Okay, can copy to F expand or uh, modify. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Like if not you allowed to modify the existing. Okay. Very good uh, point. We come back to a whole list of uh, please do not do this. And <laughs> oh, I can, do I, I can do it. Well, <laughs> like modifying 4211 would be like the worst decision uh, ever. Okay, I understand. Like on the do not do this list would be on place two, I think. Yeah? Because the table is used by thousands of objects. Yeah? Yes, That's access this table in different ways through business functions which include uh, uh, the, the header file of the table and I will run into all kinds of uh, issues. Not to mention when you uh, are in the installation. 
you will like update, keep it updated, or keep it code current every three months or every six months. And by doing that, you will download the latest specification from Oracle and then install them. So if you have uh, modified the 4211 table, you will need to retrofit every time. Yes, but it, no, not, uh, <laughs> not doing that. Define your uh, compiler version, in this case Visual Studio version 10. It will then meet a component called debug. This is very important for you because standard, the output will be set to none. And simply by changing this to file, because when you make an any modification, you need to log out from GD, make a modification, and log back in. That's the logic. Well, everybody understands that you uh, cannot apply real time any modifications. By, by putting it to file, you will start to generate debug logging immediately. Yeah? And you can specify the location of your log files over here. Definitions important. Every logic component has a different kernel type. Was the most most important one, the call object kernel. We call it COP C O E C O B. Call object kernel runs all business function logic. Yeah. So on an enterprise server you would have maybe 50 call object kernels, depending on your uh, CPU or machine. UBE kernels. Workflow kernels, we have publisher kernels, XML kernels. There's a whole range that you will see in the CNC calls as well. But uh, important that you know uh, that, they, that these exist. GD email explains itself. Uh, if you want to write an email program and you need to send out email, you would configure it here for SMTP server configuration. Interactive runtime, I would not mess with that, but you can always play around with it. If you're not uh, particularly pleased with the phone name or the phone size, try to change it and see what happens.
your local embedded HTML server, the JAWS server. Default will be localhost on port 80. And then we come here to the local web section. So on this installation, I had mine configured to immediately. So that means every time you log into E1, it will automatically start uh, the J2 EE part and already start your web server so that you're ready for it. On the other one, I have that set to on demand. And on demand, is, it will start when the, the first time that some, when somebody access the, the local host. You can also start it to manual. And then the last part. The MDR validation, that's important. The MDR are the minimum technical requirements. So every time you log into E1, it will validate that you still meet those requirements. For example, you cannot use Visual Studio 6 on a 9.10 installation. That's not going to work. So those are the minimum technical same goes for browsers, for example, and all these uh, things. Um, this ID file can become big because there are lots and lots of other options. And for example, in the XML part, you would have uh, like the heap size specification for your JVM uh, um, thing if you're using the iProdition or uh, if you're using the JDeveloper and stuff like that. So, that's so this file can be on the window. From the I think that there are some uh, values in the web fi uh, file. I encountered the using the system administration in the console, so you can modify it from there and uh, save in the. Exactly, that's true. Yeah. Okay. It, like it will also block your last sign on date and time, so of course it modified to a time. Yeah. Okay. There are also business function to read. Like maybe you want to write a program that uh, reads from this file, so there are business function that reads data from this file, there is business functions to update this file. But it's a configuration file, so it will only be applicable or applied next time we will be. So as uh, I said uh, before, um, I would advise that you use an RDP session to connect to it performance. And if you want to uh, assign more memory to it, just go to the manager section and uh, add more memory to it. You're in, Joshua.
which you see here that is completely new since 9.1. So actually it only exists for only a year. So before that we would not have all these things. And now we have the so-called E1 pages. And you didn't see that yet. It's like a structural flow where you can follow programs. And before that users had to navigate in the menu. So what I want to say is the UI is changing every day. Yeah? Last week we had the, the EMEA conference in Paris and they announced already the 9.1.4 which comes again with so many new features. It doesn't stop anymore. Yeah? It has stood still for several years and now it's changing every day. So also for us developers we need to catch up more quickly. And you will need to also see that you can serve clients who are on the older releases and also serve clients who are on the latest, the greatest releases. So you will have to do an update uh, for this minor version also? The, uh, the update that you told us earlier? Which one? Uh, the back. changing of the tables, the one that you said. Well, or only on the major versions? No, all, all, also on the, on the, but that's, the changing of the table is not a tools release. Uh, yeah, it's an application release. Oh. Tools release is only foundation. Tables and uh, application release. Yeah. Where you would change the tools release x times for one application release, you would not do this every year. Okay. Yeah. I understand. Most clients, like Oracle, tries to convince clients to keep code current. Yeah? If you, <laughs> you have clients who are still on, on XE, for example, which is from the 1986, and now they want to upgrade to 9.1. Difficult. Yeah? I would suggest to that client do a new implementation because your upgrade will probably fail. But if you keep current and if you jump to the new release every time, it's much easier. So you are doing some uh, web center as well, yeah? You know web center? Okay, so web center is a, um, a solution by Oracle that is made mainly a document management uh, system, but it, it's also like a portal yeah. space and it comes with uh, social media. And so since 9.1, web center, web center can be seamlessly integrated into E1. So, with this new feature, it's called uh, the Composite Application Functionality, CAFE 1. So you, you can create an application in E1 and link from there to a web page, external one, or to a web center space. And for example, you can have your whole uh, chats window and all these things from web center you can include in your application. That's even for me, that's all new technology. Don't know any client who is using that yet. I've only seen it myself. 
haven't used it, so it's only not exist for a couple of weeks. So I will need to learn about it myself. So we explained a little bit on a common foundation. We uh, saw how to start up a client and what goes with that. So now we're ready to finally start with technical uh, foundation. So the first part is understanding the GDE development uh, tools. There is a whole bunch of development tools available. And, um, basically with all these tools together you can combine them and uh, make powerful application developments. Um, things you can make very complex reporting. You can do anything that you want, basically. And you can integrate with third-party systems. You can receive third-party third system components into your E1 object. Everything is possible. Actually, for the people who know SAP, for example, SAP is much uh, less flexible than GNN. Is the most flexible ERP solution on the market. Give me any system and I can connect to it from GB Edwards. Vice versa, if you offer me a web service that I need to consume in my E1 application, perfectly possible in GB Edwards. There's no limitations, no boundaries. It's so uh, flexible that actually uh, we will see the, the building blocks of an application, but you understand there is a data dictionary. There are tables, which we saw for the web. There are business views. Business views are like SQL views. But business views come with limitations. You can only do five tables in a business view. You can do limited join functionalities. But you get what it says. If that is not enough for you, just create an Oracle view on your uh, SQL developer. And by using a virtual table, you will link your virtual table in your E1 object to that Oracle view. So anything goes. Anything goes. You can run a store procedure from your E1 application, all possible. Maybe that also makes it so complex because anything goes. Because everything is possible, you need to make sure that you do things in a proper way or you might run into issues. Most commonly, performance issues, that's the biggest bottleneck always when um, people start to start developing in GD Edwards. And then you have people like Maria complaining. The application is too slow or whatever. So for the ones who uh, 
are in the, the client, you can go to the object management uh, workbench. So that is the OMW command in the fast part. So what is this uh, object management workbench? It is basically a workbench that manages all of the E1 objects, and that is literally it's all of the objects. We cannot bypass the OMW. Uh, developers use this workbench to create new objects, check out existing objects from a central development environment, central objects, and subsequently copying those objects to the workstation and create replicated objects. And they can use the development tools to change objects and check them back in for others to access. That is very um, high level set how it works. You know? Everybody understands that concept, right? Central objects, that's the only version of the truth. When you check out an object, you create a new version of the replicated object on your workstation. You then have the token for that uh, object, you can modify it. When you check it in, you will override the central object. And when that CNC makes a package using that central object and deploys it to the enterprise server, then also the end users will have access to your, your changes. How can, you, how can you make a package? I've seen that when you install the package... Uh... Package build, uh, you have a package uh, assembly, package build and package deployment application. And those are uh, in your tool sets. You can run them also from the manual. Services. An update package is always linked to a parent package. Here, you can include all kinds of components. For example, if you want to roll out a new tools release, yeah, you would only include the foundation component. And the foundation component would include your new tools release. You would make a package with the new tools release and deploy it to the clients. And then on the clients, we receive the package and you can install it. That's the most important one, the objects and the languages, of course.
you will associate all the languages for which you have to uh, make packages. So usually, if you are lucky, it will only be default domestic language. If you are not lucky, you have to do packages in, in seven languages. That's what it is. So default is just domestic language. And then you click the end button. And now your package is ready. So you continue to the default builds. So now you have selected the objects that you want to build. Now you're going to make the build definition. So you have here the options to build. It's a client and server package, obviously. You select the enterprise server for which you want to build the objects. You have only one. Specifications for the business functions. And then you click submit that. You can make a package on any client. By default, you create a package on the deployment server, but you can do that on any client. So the first thing it will do in the package builds is compile your object. It does that by launching the piece build application. Which is cool. So what I'm showing you here is not something that developers would do. It's not something that functions completely. So it's not CNC administrator. System administrator course package assembly. We have more. Eu nu mă trebuie. Nu mă rog că le spune. Da, să simt. Și apoi de-aia îmi aduc. Da, da. Îți vă doresc un final client site, create a client package, îți vă doresc un final enterprise server, copy the objects over there, compile them on the enterprise server, and only when you have a successful package, only then you are able to deploy it. Now you refer to the changes made by a package without problems. If you made a, a bug, if you if your new code calls a bug, yeah, you can of course uh, either refer back to a previous package and ignore that previous package if you have it, or you can fix your uh, okay. make a new package and ignore it. This package, what is it in the final? It's a AR. What? It's just a spec file. And how you deploy it on the? You deploy it using a batch job. It's called the the, the package build deployment job, and that copies basically all the folders like the source includes spec, OBG, the make files. Everything it will be copied over to the to the enterprise server. That's what the deployment is. Okay. But on the web. A server is different, it's a WAR file, a deployed WAR file, of course. So there are multiple components uh, in it. So the deployment server, you see. So we have already an issue. have all the components to build packages. That is why most packages will be built on the deployment server. Anyway, what we want to explain here is the central objects. Central objects reside on the deployment server and there is one per part code. how you start. Then you make a package for that pod code. It can be a full package or an update 
package that can be served package and a client package. The server package gets then deployed to the enterprise server. The client package gets deployed to the web client and the web development client or your local client. Yeah? By doing that, it will create a set of replicated objects here. Let me say here. See, my server package went well, so I have an issue on my client. Anyway, so when you would be finished rebuilding this package, stations that you want to deploy to, for example, the enterprise server. And when you add that, can you log out of your machine? So you see the difference now? So I built a package and I deployed the package and I'm restarting my uh, development client and I have prompted for a list that says this is the scheduled packages that are waiting for you. You can select it now and it will install the specs from that build definition onto your local workstation. Everybody understands that whole concept, yeah? Deployment server center objects, one per cloud code. Deployment server will build the packages, full packages containing everything, update packages containing selected objects, modus server side, modus client side, usually always both. Don't see anything why you would only do a server side package, it doesn't make any sense. Server gets deployed to the enterprise server, creates replicated objects. The client side is deployed to the HTML side and the, the web development client. 
the web development candidate will look like this. So you want it for the new package, and you are able to accept it now and install it or deploy it. Yeah. As a developer, you decide yourself what comes on your workstation and what doesn't go on your workstation. No CNC guy should tell you yeah, what to install. That's what I'm going to deploy. CNC administrator, maybe in the future, you will not be bothered by this uh, client too much other than building packages. It will be basically the only thing you will do on the, on the, on the client. Okay. Mm -hmm. The other ones, that maybe do developments, they will use the client, only the clients. You know? They will uh, do anything on the client but building packages. Probably the package build application is, of course, secure so that only system administrators can use the package. Last thing you want to do is uh, have a developer building packages uh, at will because that's not possible. Okay, so the object management workbench is a central workbench to um, start from and modify all your objects into E1. So now let's go through all these objects. Uh, the first one that we start with is the data dictionary. Um, and the data dictionary is uh, just like a dictionary that we all know. It will contain word definitions, data dictionary, for all the data items uh, with its definitions and with its attributes. Okay. And again, this is a central repository. So usually in a system there is only one data dictionary. In an advanced configuration, CSC might split out the data dictionary into a test data dictionary and a production data dictionary. If you do that, it's really complex because every time you make a package, you will need to include all the, the change data dictionary item into the package. That is really advanced, uh, advanced stuff. So usually one data dictionary for the whole system, both production as well as development, as well as uh, all the time. All the right. So uh, the attributes that you define in the data dictionary determine how a data item appears on reports and forms. How it validates the data entry in an application. It will assign the default uh, descriptions to columns and rows. It will provide text and glossary help for end users, for example, and it is stored in a table. Okay. So, as such, it is the smallest building block of any E1 uh, application, and it's arguably the most important of any other E1 object. So Daniel uh, suggested to modify the 4211. I said this would be on the second place of the do not do list. And the first place would be changing standard data dictionary items. Anybody who changes the standard data dictionary item is a fool, should be fired immediately. Yeah? <laughs> because you can only imagine what would happen if you were, for example, change this data item, DCDO order type, which is used in hundreds of tables hundreds of objects if somebody decides to like, modify the length from D, 2 to 3 characters or from 2 to 1 yeah, your whole application starts to work immediately it all falls apart
objects. We divide, divide objects into object librarian objects and non object librarian objects. The dictionary is a non object librarian object because it's only a definition, a flat definition, it's not a specification. Can we see here? So we have the data item name, warning type, we have the alias, DCDO. It is defined into the primary data element group, the glossary group. It comes with a default description, order type, a default product code and a reporting code. The most important is of course the data type. This one is a string, so if you go into that and click on the visual assist, it will take you uh, to all the data types that you get with uh, nodes. So we have uh, characters, GD dates, those are Julian date formats, integers, C blobs, binary blobs, strings, varchars, uTime, identifiers, and numeric. Right? So people who know programming language would already remark now pretty different from what I am used to. We don't have flows or anything like that. So we limit this. These are our base types. Yeah. These are the raw uh, types that we use. We come back to all these uh, later. What else do you see here? You have uh, the size. If you define a string, you need to specify the size for it. Yeah? It can be anything from 2 to 100,000. But bear in mind that the string in GDE is not a varchar. Yeah? <coughs> it's no varchar. So if you uh, set your size to length 30 on the database, this will be white space. And so it will uh, take up space in the database. Yeah? So somebody said that GDE was advanced. In that aspect, it's not advanced at all. Because if it was advanced, this would be a varchar, and if it's blank, it would truncate and mm -hmm. make it blank. Yeah. So that's just something that's interesting to know. Yeah. You have some attributes, for example, uh, in here, somebody said your order type can only be uppercase, so you cannot enter it in uh, lowercase, and then you can assign a 
advanced security to it, allow black entry, yes or no, auto includes, do not auto all attributes. This is also important. The control type is a user defined code edit. What does that mean? It means that you can only input values to it that are included in the associated UDC, in the associated user defined code. User defined code is a list of values that you uh, compose, and only those will be here. You understand that they all have to match up. You cannot make a, a UDC that is a seven long, put it into a, a two, a two uh, size fit. Everybody understand that all these things are starting to come together already. Uh, you cannot make an application later on and use DCPO, data hiding in your application and then go and say, I'm going to overwrite the data dictionary attributes, which you can do, and says the size is four. Does it make any sense? The data dictionary determines how the data item will be controlled, and not the other way around. You specify a glossary text for it, this glossary text will be used on the web client for the end users when they click on a grid, for example, and the grid contains the DCTO data item. They can click F1 on it, and F1 will display this text. You can associate a default value with it, not in this case. A visual assist. Visual assist, as we have seen, are these nice things, that's a visual assist. Visual assist come in different uh, forms. You can also do a calculator, a calendar, a U-time converter. And in this case, it's a search form called select user defined codes. You can associate edit rules to it. In this case, a user defined code, and here you specify User defined code 00 AD. So if you want to know what is this UDC, you just type the UDC command in the false part. You enter the UDC type of the codes, and you see all the available products. Consultants or functional consultants, you should never, well, normally you don't remove the standard UDCs and you leave them in there. Create a web one, yeah. Add a new one to this one or create a new UDC, whatever. But not the existing ones. A little bit quicker because some come back to all these things. So you can also do display rules. So, already important, click, please click the cancel button because you never know that you might have uh, modified something now, click cancel. If you go to a small project, probably the data dictionary is not secure. If you go to a big project, even for developers, they will secure the data dictionary application. And there is only one dedicated developer that changes the data dictionary to avoid issues. So data dictionary is central repository containing all the data items. Um, it defines uh, the item definitions, the attributes to the data item. And data dictionary falls under the non-object librarian objects. That means there is no specification file, it's only flat data. category of objects is the table, and the table is the first one of the object librarian objects. DD, TBLA, table. Table, everybody knows what a table is. It's a relational database table. It's used to store the data that an application uses. 
you can use the table design aids.exe to create new tables if the application requires it. To create a table, you select data items that we have seen before from here, and then assign key fields as indexes for retrieving and updating the data. Obviously, when you have uh, created a new table, it doesn't exist in the database. It only exists as an object in E1, so you need to generate the table definition and or any ex indexes on the database. Table design aid, you access from within the OMW, and the naming conventions dictate that all table objects start with the letter F. So for the people who want to follow, um, you don't have any projects yet, so just use your uh, default project. You should have a default project that says demo. Then go to, go to the search on the right pane. Search for a table, for example, 4211. Click find, right click here, and click there, and move it over. Then select the object on the left, go into the design button. We're not going to check it out now, we just want to see the definition. Go to the design tools, start the table design. Yet. Yes, we know it's not checked out. It's a very basic editor, so I guess nobody will have any issue creating it there, but it's very easy. And it's all, uh, what you see is what you get, so there is no hidden uh, functionalities. So this is the 4211 table, it has more columns, more than 250 columns. Thank you. 